All right, everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, IREM Robotics Seminar. And um, so it's my pleasure to introduce uh, our speaker, uh, Professor uh, Chen Chen Fei. Uh, so Fifi is right now is a, a assistant professor at the University of Southern California. Uh, she has a joint appointment with ECE and uh, MAE, right? So mechanical and aerospace engineering. Um, and uh, she's actually our own uh, Georgia Tech alumni. So where uh, I think she, you graduated uh, here with your PhD around 20? 20 yeah, 2015. 15, 2015, yeah. okay, good. And uh, after that, she moved to uh, UPenn, uh, Graspo Lab uh, for her postdoc uh, before she joined USC. Uh, Fifi also have a you know, very prestigious uh, profile, um, including getting the NSF uh, Career Award and also uh, several best paper award, including the one from RSS. Um, Fifi have a very you know cool research on robot locomotion, uh, you know modeling, sensing, and control. Uh, I think especially when sometimes when we think about this um, uh, very complex you know lagged uh, locomotion problems with highly complex terrain, you know environmental interaction, you know there are a lot of you know challenging questions to ask and scientific questions to you know to address and. Uh, uh, I believe Fifi will show some, you know, very cool stuff today. And uh, uh, let's welcome uh, Fifi and look forward to your talk. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> thanks for the introduction and thanks for having me here. I'm very excited to come back. Uh, I remember myself listening to the seminars in this very same room and eating lunch, so it's all a good memory. Uh, so glad to share with you about our recent work on robotic locomotion sensing on deformable terrains like sand and mud. So nowadays we are hoping our robots could take on uh, increasingly important roles in our society, right? helping us with delivery, search and rescue, planetary exploration. And honestly, uh, one of the first uh, reasons I want to start to work in robotics is I hate hiking and I want robots to carry me and my bags. And we all know that we are still a little bit away from that dream. And mostly because you know when it comes to uh, walking and running on uh, non-flat and non-rigid terrains, especially, it can still be increasingly challenging. Um, even I will have some troubles so when I take the robot to the sand dunes and then when I was walking up the down, I actually had a video, I didn't show it here, but I was trying to raise the robot up a sand dune and I failed. Uh, sorry for you know representing the humankind, but the robot actually beat me to it. Um, so it's a quite challenging task to walk on uh, non-rigid, non-flat terrains because on rigid uh, surfaces, we know what's gonna happen. When you push on the ground, the ground pushes you right back, right? So we know what's gonna happen, we can plan our motion, we can, we can predict our dynamics. However, once you start to move on soft, deformable terrains, it's really not the case here. Uh, the terrain, the ground start to yield and deform and flow underneath your foot. And the best is you, don't, you never know when it's going to flow and when it's going to suddenly become so solid and then support you. So it's very difficult to predict what's gonna happen, the terrain responses, and making it very difficult to um, work on control and planning for robotics. So, um, so one of the reasons is because um, terrains like sand and mud, uh, they have these dual properties. So they can either behave solid-like or behave fluid-like, right? So we can let sand to basically slip and flow through our fingers, or we can basically build sand castles where they basically behave solid-like. Um, and this is critical for locomotion, but there is also a good general rule to predict what sand is going to do, when it's going to behave solid-like versus fluid-like, which is going to be critical for locomotion. And the general principle is if you, they are ill-stressed material, meaning there is a threshold. When you apply a force beyond that threshold, they are going to yield and fail, okay? So if we put a piece of paper on the soft sand, the sand is not going to do anything. It's behaving solid-like because the apply force, the weight of the paper, is way lower than the yield stress of sand. But if you try to force something through the sand, the sand is going to deform and yield. And we'll keep coming back to this um, principle when we talk about locomotion on sand. But first of all, in order to better understand the subtleties of how these different sand properties influence robot locomotion, my group approaches this by understanding the physical interaction between locomotors and their environment. So there are a variety of animals who uh, move really well on a variety of natural terrains. But we can't just ask these animals how they do it. And also they look different, they move differently. So one of the approaches that my group takes is twofold. 
we build engineering devices that can allow us to control and create different frame properties. And then we build uh, bio-inspired robots that can serve as a physical model for us to understand or control, uh, generate different strategies as a template of biological locomotor. And using those, we can study the interaction mechanism between the two and develop general uh, models that can explain the uh, locomotion performance and eventually aid with robot design and control. So in today's talk, I'm going to use a few uh, example cases to tell you how we develop these locomotion models and principles to improve robot mobility on deformable substrates. Um, we are also going to talk to you about uh, how we develop new sensing methods to let the robot know how to, uh, how to understand what terrains they are working on. And then I'm going to also give you some examples of how we apply these new locomotion and sensing methods to have the robot aid with um, uh, missions like Earth and the planetary exploration. So let's first talk about locomotion. So the example I'm going to give you is for locomotion on muddy terrains, which uh, brings a lot of challenge if you ever walk on a mud or drive your car onto mud. You know what I'm talking about, you can easily get slip or stuck in these places. So uh, one animal that moves particularly well on these trains is called a mudskipper. So it's essentially a weird fish that can walk on land using both of its fins. So uh, in order to understand how mudskipper can actually create really efficient locomotion on a variety of different muddy surfaces, we uh, develop a really simple robot that basically has a similar morphology, you have two flippers that they can move to the front of the body like mudskipper does and then perform a sweeping motion uh, backwards to propel itself forward and then eventually extract and swing back. So use this robot allow us to uh, precisely control the gait and the kinematics and also place the robot in different mud composition while we track the locomotion performance so we can understand how the different mud compositions can affect the robot locomotion and how does the robot locomotion uh, strategy matter. So in order to do this, we need to first create some mud. Um, and one method that we developed to create mud in lab, uh, it's sort of like baking to try different recipes. And the good recipe that has proven to work really well is to use a mixture of sand, clay, and water. So this mixture has uh, shown to exhibit the qualitative same behavior as natural mud, which contains fine particles and organic matters that basically exhibit different uh, behaviors between frictional and cohesional. So what we do is we, um, we create each mixture by stirring them uh, evenly and put them into a tank. And we systematically vary the water content and also the clay ratio, which is the percentage of clay in the solid. And we notice that even a very tiny change in the composition, for example, 2% of water content can actually result in significant force from the mud. So now let's see, uh, and I'm mainly going to show you uh, some of the results from uh, this particular clay ratio, which is the clay versus sand three to one, and vary the water content from zero to uh, its uh, saturation. So when we place the robot into the mud, what we see is interestingly, uh, the speed has a quite large of variation. In the intermediate water content, the robot can exhibit quite effective locomotion and move forward when the water content is around 25 and 26%. But even with a small um, two to 4% of water content change, the robot performance starts to drop significantly. So with a water content of 30 or water content of uh, 24, the robot speed will quickly drop to zero after the first few steps. So this is kind of interesting and we wonder why it fails and how can we basically adapt the strategy to make it move better. The first thing we notice is the failure behaviors for the two different mud water content regions are quite different. So what I'm showing you here is the robot forward displacement over time. So the slope would basically indicate the speed of the robot. So for the high water content region, what you are seeing is the first step, the speed is quite large, but quickly it will basically start to become flat, meaning the speed will quickly converge to zero. Another thing that we would basically observe is that the flipper, when it fails, will uh, start to slip a lot through the mud, and the step length will uh, monotonically decrease very quickly. 
Um, so this is the observation, and I'll talk to you about why that happens. The um, failure mode at a high mud water content is quite different. What you would notice is that the robot does not seem to have uh, difficulties uh, and does not slip through the mud nearly as much. And instead, it can uh, quickly push itself forward as soon as the insertion. However, what we does observe that there's a large oscillation in the position, meaning the speed is basically going uh, positive to negative oscillate. And what that means is that we notice the flipper is actually perturbing a lot of the mud material forward during the swim phase. And that's going to create a backward um, speed on the body. So in order to know what's the mechanism that's governing these failure modes, what we did is to measure the force. So what's the flipper experiencing when the robot is moving into the mud? So the first thing that we did is to emulate the sweeping region of the flipper by mounting the flipper on a linear actuator and send the linear actuator to drag horizontally in the mud mixture while we use a low cell to measure the mud shear resistance force. So this will basically tell us when the robot is trying to propel itself forward, what happens. And here is the force um, for different water regions. So the y-axis is how much of the mud resistance uh, and the x-axis is when the flipper starts uh, in the insertion and sweeping. What we can see is from the blue to red, at the water percent only increased 8%. The recent force from the mud that the robot can generate has dropped significantly, almost five folds. It's from almost 60 Newton to uh, below 10 Newtons. So this is what this is going to do is this essentially represents the yield force that we talk about, that there's a threshold um, only when you apply a applied force below the yield force, you can push against the mud and propel yourself forward. So the applied force here is computed as the um, drag force you need to overcome when you pull the robot across the mud surface, as well as the acceleration induced um, inertial force. So what we can learn here is when the water content is uh, small, as this blue line is showing, all the yield force is larger than the applied force. So based on the criteria, in this case, the mud is going to stay solid-like. So the robot was able to push against the solidified mud and propel itself forward. However, when the water content starts to increase and the force drop, you can see that only in this uh, solid red line region, that's where the robot applied force is smaller than the yield force. And that's where the robot can effectively push itself forward. And that explains why the robot failed, because as the, as the yield force continued to decrease, during the entire sweeping region, the flipper was not being able to solidify the mud. It will keep slipping through the deformable substrate and making the robot does not being able to propel itself forward. And based on the effective region that we can actually compute the step lens, oops, let me go back. And based on how large this effective advancing range it is, which is essentially the uh, part where the curved line is above the red required force to propel forward, we can actually predict the actual speed or the step lens of the robot. And we can show that as the water content increases, the robot will basically have a significant drop in its step length due to the shortened effective propulsion range. So that actually explains the failure mechanism in the high water content mud. So as the water content increases, the flipper will not be able to push against the solidified mud and eventually causing the slippage. However, one thing that we did not, the mystery that we did not solve is that the model predicted constant step length. For a given water content, we can generate a um, certain number of yield force, and therefore we are able to predict a constant step length. But in experiment, what we observe is the step length will keep decreasing. So initially, the robot was able to generate a reasonable step length, but quickly the step length will monotonically drop. And the reason for that is if you look at the footstep of the robot, 
when the first step footprints are not overlapping, the robot can actually maintain a constant step length because each time the disturbed material does not overlap. But if the stop the step length start to decrease to a certain extent that you are starting to going to encounter the previously disturbed material, uh, that disturbed material is going to lead with reduce the surface height and also further reduce the shear resistance. So in that case, you are going to further having the reduce, uh, reduction of your step length and leading to this progressive failure. So with that failure mechanism understood, uh, we know that basically we can predict the step length and there's a minimal step length in order for the robot to prevent the disturbed material and maintain its forward motion. So why is that useful for us? Because once we understand how it feels, we can use the model to predict how we can make the robot move better. So we know that essentially the uh, propulsion is essentially a result of the competition between the yield force, which is the red line here for a certain mud content, and also the required force that you need to overcome the drag and move forward. So essentially, uh, the competition of the, these two forces determines how large of advancing range you have, which directly reflected in the robot speed. So for this yellow speed here that we use in our experiment, the uh, required force is, um, is determining the relatively short advancing range. So what we could do is just by slightly reducing the flipper speed by less than 20%, we can actually lower the required force, which is the acceleration, re acceleration induced uh, inertial force, and increase the advancing range the robot can solidify the mud and move forward. So with this adaptation, only 20% of the speed, we can increase the step length of the robot to above the minimal required step length and therefore achieve effective locomotion. So in order to see if our prediction was correct, we actually deploy the robot with, the two, with and without the adaptation in the same mud composition. And what we are seeing here, the left side is with before the adaptation and after the adaptation only with 20% of reduction in the flipper speed. Now the robot was able to always push against solidified mud and you can see the, um, the foot track is uh, constantly spaced and also it does not disturb nearly as much of the mud mixture and was able to move forward. And we were able to achieve a three times faster speed in the mud just with that small change in the robot flipper speed. So I have told you that how the robot fails in high water content mud, but what we haven't learned is why does it fail in the low water content? Because based on the model prediction, if it is true that this is the only way the robot fails, then we should have a much higher locomotion speed when the mud water content drops. But we know that's not the truth. So in order to do that, we also look into the vertical force the flipper experienced when it was inserting into the mud and extracting. So essentially we use a linear actuator again to push the flipper into the mud and then pull it out while mirroring the force. So here I'm plotting the hysteresis cycle of how the force looks like. Uh, the positive force is when the, pen, when the intruder push into the mud and the mud give it upward resistance force. And the bottom one, the negative force, is when you pull from the mud and the mud is, uh, because of the cohesion, it's pulling you downward. So for uh, non-cohesive material, when you are pulling from the sand, for example, you will basically have zero force. But here what you are seeing is when you have decreased water content in the mud, due to the clay content and the water cohesion, you would experience a much larger um, negative force that's basically pulling you down. So that's the yield force of mud in the vertical direction. And based on our criteria, if you apply a force that's smaller than the yield force, the mud is going to solidify. When we are trying to push ourselves forward, solidified mud is good. We want to solidify it so we can push ourselves forward. But we will want to try to pull the flipper or the leg out of mud. The solidified mud will actually cause the flipper to be entrapped in there and not being able to fully lift out of the surface. So for that reason, what the reason for the robot to have a backward or oscillating behavior is because uh, the large um, solidified mud 
is causing a large negative acceleration on the flipper during the lifting stage and reducing its speed so that it did not, was not able to fully lift out of the mass surface during the extraction phase. Uh, so when it's starting the swing phase forward, supposedly in air, it was still tra in trapped in the mud content and it will shear a thin layer of mud forward during the swing phase. And that shear force is going to cause this backward body displacement that we observe from experiment. So by looking at, by computing this entrapment uh, depths based on the uh, intersection between the extraction for uh, the apply force and the yield force, we can basically compute how much backward body displacement we will get and uh, deduct that from the previously advancing uh, step lengths. And now we get the full model prediction, which is looking qualitatively similar to our experiment measurements, where the intermediate uh, mud content, the robot was able to both solidify the mud when pushing forward and also uh, successfully lifting the mud and fluidize the mud when extraction. But there are also two failure modes. In the high water content, the robot fails because of the fluidized mud during the advancing stage. And uh, in the low water content, the robot fails due to the solidified mud when you try to extract your flipper. So with that, similarly, we're also going to uh, be able to predict how to make the locomotion better. So again, there's um, essentially the key is to uh, have the mud fluidize when you try to extract. So you can either by doing that by lower the um, uh, yield force or to increase apply force. And here what we are showing is to by reduce the extraction flipper speed by only less than 30%, you can effectively reduce the, the, um, the yield force of the mud and making the mud easily fluidizable when you try to extract. And just by applying this small adaptation, we can actually completely eliminate the backward displacement. And here is the um, actual experiment where we will apply this predicted adaptation. So what you can see here is just by lowering the um, uh, yield force during the extraction, the robot was able to eliminate the backward displacement uh, previously observed and achieve uh, effective locomotion forward on this low water content map. So the takeaway from this is by better understanding the material response and the failure mechanism, we can use very simple and minor adjustment in the robot locomotion strategy and achieve a huge improvement in the robot speed. Now the question is, we know what locomotion strategy to use on each different surface but how do we know what surface properties we are currently moving on? So let's talk about our recent work on uh, robot sensing to differentiate different terrain properties. Um, so differentiate different pro terrain properties is very important because in the natural environment where we want to send our robots, uh, the terrain strengths can vary significantly. Uh, I already said that for the mud, uh, adding 2% of water can already, reduce, uh, can already cause a large uh, change in the strength. And for the sand, it's the same. So for the sand, usually we use the uh, packing fraction to uh, the indication of the sand uh, softness. So the volume fraction is defined as the solid volume of the particles uh, divided by their occupied volume, which is the yellow shaded box. So it's the uh, ratio of the blue versus blue plus yellow. Uh, so for the sand, even with 7% of volume fraction change, you can get five times variation in the uh, yield force in the sand. So if the robot were to work on the sand and mud terrains, it's critical that they can uh, have online measurement of the terrain strengths so that they can select the locomotion strategies accordingly to successfully move across these surfaces. But how should we do this? Uh, if we were to look at a sand dune, the sand compaction is not easily told, uh, can be told by vision. And for humans and animals, when we are working on these natural terrains, a more informative way is for us to feel the sand strength from our foot. So we wonder if we could let the robot to do the same thing. Um, there are previous work that basically add uh, tactile sensors to the robot toe 
but it's quite challenging because during uh, dynamic locomotion, the robot usually applies a large impact force on the toe, which requires the sensor to have a large measurement range. At the same time, we have seen that we need the robot to be able to uh, have the sensor to be sensitive enough to pick up the subtleties in the terrain response uh, difference. And also there's a wire uh, complexity and a waterproof if we want the robot to have carry a sensor on its toe and stick into mud. So one opportunity that we have is recently uh, there have been uh, advancement in the actuator technology that has enabled uh, direct drive motors, which is a fancy name for gearless without a gearbox. Uh, these motors have really good force transparency which means they can be very sensitive to any small external forces, but also react super fast. So what I'm going to show you in this video is um, the, there's the direct drive motor spinning, and uh, my friend Turner is going to blow air very lightly on the motor. The motor will be able to sense this air blow, and then switch its rotation direction when it does. So it's that sensitive that it can feel the, even the tiniest uh, force on it. Um, how can we make use of it? Well, the idea is if, if we can use uh, these motors to build robot legs, perhaps we have a chance to just use the motor itself uh, to serve as a sensor to detect how soft the sand is, how sticky the mud is, so that we can basically inform the locomotion strategies. Um, so Direct drive motor or the gearless motor are not new, right? So we have uh, gearboxes for the longest time and we have different gear ratios. Uh, and we use direct drive motors in the drones. However, uh, for the longest time, direct drive motors were too weak to support leg locomotion. So we have the gearbox for a reason to convert speed to torque output. But recently, uh, somebody King's group has made advancement in uh, they found that uh, by increasing the gap radiance, which is the distance between the ro motor rotor and stator, you can significantly increase the motor torque density. And this basically enables the direct drive actuators to be used in, to support dynamic leg locomotion. So what we are doing is to see, so there are some previous work to use this uh, motor to detect collision in robotic arms or uh, other appendages. But what we are trying to do is to see if we build a robot leg using this direct drive motor, can we actually accurately measure the ground yield force so they can basically guide the locomotion strategy adaptation. So what we did first is to build this super simple two motor leg. So there's one motor here and the other motor here coaxial. And then uh, each motor connects to one of uh, hip bar. So it's a four bar linkage or five bar linkage design. Um, and then the knee, is pa knee joint is passive, and then they meet at the toe. And the toe, can basically, the toe is basically the one that contact with the ground. So each motor can record their own position, and they use uh, the difference between their desired position and their recorded actual position uh, to estimate the current, and then eventually estimate the torque of each joint. And then through the kinematics using the Jacobian, we can convert the joint force uh, joint torque to get estimate of the toe force in the water frame. So in order to understand whether the leg has the feasibility to detect terrain strength, we designed a very simple sensing protocol, which I'm going to show you in a second. So the leg will basically, at the beginning of the sensing protocol, will just stay a few, start from a few centimeters above the surface, and then it's going to vertically poke into the ground and then perform a horizontal drag across the surface. So during the vertical penetration, this, uh, as you go deeper, so here I'm plotting the force, so you are the leg is experiencing when it's vertically low into the ground. So this is basically how much force, how, how, so how quickly the force increase essentially determines how, how much normal uh, strength or stiffness the ground have. And during the shear, uh, the force will eventually start to stabilize to a steady state. So this average uh, shear force will basically tell you uh, what's the shear strength of the material. So using these two very basic motion, we can actually get useful information about the normal and the shear strength of the material. And as we show in the mud study, these are the critical information the robot needs to guide its locomotion decisions. So how do we know it's working? You know, we can get some numbers, but how do we know it's correct? 
In order to validate this, uh, we build this device called the fluidized bed. So what it does is it can basically control or create different sense stiffness for testing. So what this is, is it's basically this tube is connecting a giant uh, blower. You can think of it as a leaf blower that basically blows air into this tank. Then the airflow goes through, oops, go back. The airflow goes through a layer of porous plastic, which is this white sheet here. So the porous plastic have micro-sized holes in them so that the sand on top will not fall through, but airflow can go through. And by sending the different airflow to the sand, what you do is you are basically creating a fluidized sand. So let me show you a video. When I turn on the airflow, when the air goes through the sand, it weakens the sand, and the larger airflow you send, the softer the ground becomes. So it's just a very interesting way for us to create repeatable and um, controllable sand stiffness. Um, and you know, uh, the, this is the first time this crab has been sitting in a fluidized bed. I mean, so we, right, so we never have seen it. Uh, so it's looking a bit confused, but once it get the hand of it, it actually can run super fast, uh, even the very weakened uh, ground. Um, so what we use this to do is we mount the robot leg and have the toe penetrated into the surface where we can actually prepare the sand inside with different airflow, or we can basically, once we set to loosely pack, we can set short air pulses to pack it down to more closely compact the sand. So essentially, we can create different stiffness of sand, and we can verify if the leg can tell it. So this is the result when we poke the leg into the fluidized bed sand. Um, what I'm showing here is different sand compaction, right? So the solid volume uh, divided by occupant volume. So a large number would basically be so tightly packed, should have a higher stiffness. And the lower value would basically be, it should be weaker. And what we are showing is basically the normal force that we are measured by the leg when it's basically penetrated vertically down. So you can see that when the volume fraction decreases from the top to the bottom, the measured uh, slope, which is the force per depth, the ground stiffness, also weakens uh, monotonically. And this is actually consistent with um, measurements from a lab-grade force sensor and also agree with the literature review, uh, the granular literature. So this basically confirms that our lab has the capability to, um, to detect the differences in the ground properties, at least in the normal strength. Uh, and we also did similar tests in the shear direction and verified its capability to sense the shear force. So how can we make use of it now? So the first thing that we did is we sent a, uh, this lab uh, we, we sent it with this friend, so it's a, a hex beetle robot, so we did not directly use it at the leg. We, we use it in an arm setting, so we basically mount it on another robot, have the robot carry this uh, robotic leg as an arm to walk around the deadlift. So what we want to do is basically to see if when the robot is walking a few steps, we ask it to stop and basically poke this um, arm setting leg into the surface and perform that sensing uh, protocol that I showed you. So uh, when the robot is walking around the desert, so we took the robot to Y Sands in New Mexico, and the robot basically just walk around the sand dune. Uh, this is within 10 minutes, and it's a GPS track of the robot, so the robot was able to make very densely uh, distributed uh, measurements across the entire desert just using this field setting. So what we can do is now we can basically have a very uh, complete mapping of the soil strength across the entire desert, which was not available to us before. And turns out it was very useful data for, um, for, for um, earth scientists and even planetary scientists to study um, uh, sediment transport and desertification. So what they had before we come up with the robot is they literally have to either build these large um, uh, sand traps and, and monitor in the middle of the desert or 30 meter long wind tunnel in the middle of the desert to get one data point, which is super labor and time in intensive and very low density of, um, of measurement. So what we offer to them is we offer a robot lab that can serve as a scientific instrumentation to help them gather uh, soil strength data across the desert. So we have two configurations. One is what I have shown you, the robot leg or arm mounted on the uh, hexapedal robot to walk around the desert to measure the soil strength or erodibility. The other one is the Rex robot carrying anemometer to measure the wind speed and also uh, little 
uh, laser gate to measure the sand erosion uh, density. So using these, we were actually able to help the scientists to tell why desert fishing uh, happens and what's governing it. We send the robot to walk across desert from the more active part of dune. You can see there's no vegetation at all to the more stable lines dunes where the vegetation start to grow. So we asked the robot, okay, what's different about these two places and what's governing the change? Um, so it turns out what the robot measured is the soil strength from the active dune to the stabilized dune, the soil erosibility of the strength start to increase significantly, but the wind speed that we measure drop significantly. So it's interesting because the sand erodibility is essentially the yield force and the wind speed is applied force that basically shears the sand out. So it turns out just like the robot locomotion case, the nature also works the same way. Uh, the densification of the dune stabilization is literally just a competition between the two forces. The wind force trying to apply a force just like the flipper, and then the uh, soil erodibility or soil yield force try to play a role of the defensive side. Uh, so the data that we collected using the robot was able to help determining the governing factor and help prevent densification. And inspired by that, we also discovered that you know, we don't have to use the lag always the same way, right? You know, the lag is almost an active sensor. You can move the lag in a variety of different ways, and these different fashion of movement give you different information about the environment. We have already shown that we can do just like simple penetration, just poke down or horizontal shear, which the penetration can tell you, you know, the normal strength and also if there's any layering in the vertical direction. Whereas the shear can, oops, um, the shear can tell you um, the hard, oops, sorry about that. Where the shear can tell you the hard, the uh, shear strength and also any variation across the horizontal direction. But we can also do fun things. For example, we can do a repeated loading at the same spot, so keep poking down. And that's going to tell you the resilience of the material you are working with. Uh, and also we can do a layered shearing, so remove one layer and going deeper every time, which can also confirm uh, the structure in uh, the horizontal direction. And we actually deploy the lag uh, in a variety of different ways to gather information. So here the first application is that we can just use vertical penetration to find either water ice or surface crust. So here I'm showing you the first video, which is the lag poking on a surface crust. You can see that once the crust, upon the crust rupture, you have a very significant force drop. And this maximum point represents the yield strength of the sand. And similar for water ice. So when the lag pokes through the surface ice, it has a similar force, oops, force drop. It has a very similar force drop. And again, by looking for these rupture signatures, um, the robot can detect what substrate is working on. Is there any hollow surface crust or is there surface ice? And then adapt its locomotion strategy accordingly. But also a fun application is, you know, if we are going to send a rover or robot to the moon and trying to look for traces of water ice, now we get a new tool. Potentially we can send this robot and just by walking every step and looking for the water ice signature, we were able to identify potential areas that have these uh, traces of water ice and then perform more comprehensive uh, measurement on there. This is another um, uh, strategy that we were using the repeated loading and we basically were able to tell the brittleness and resilience of the surface area. So one sample that we did is a low resistance sample uh, in the white sands desert and we were able to see that, oops, sorry about this. We were able to see that after the repeated loading uh, in a nearby area or the same spot, the strength will basically drop significantly. Whereas in a high risk sample, we can see that barely there's not much drop after repeated loading. So these can help us determine what type of terrain we are working on, uh, and also shows that the lag can basically detect very subtle uh, differences. So going forward, what we are trying to do is say, okay, we got one lag working, but what about the four robot? The dream is to basically have the each step become a experiment and a measurement, so the robot can basically inform the terrain properties. So what we are trying to do right now is to extend the proprioceptive sensing that we did with one leg to the entire robot. So the robot can basically perform the sensing during every step of walking. 
So the platform that we use to implement this is uh, the Ghost Robotics Spirit 40, which is a quadrupedal robot with uh, three degree of freedom leg. Uh, it was able to produce highly dynamical uh, gates and also use quadri-directional uh, quadri motor, which means low gear ratio. So it can basically put, output more power, but while still maintaining a good force sensing uh, capability. And we also integrate the GPS and also camera and IMU. So when the robot works, we can uh, record its state. So here I'm going to show you some of the initial data we collected from the Ysense when the robot is walking from a relatively packed region uh, to a relatively loosely packed sand region. And what I'm showing here is the robot toe position recorded the toe force and also the force, normal force versus depth, which we use the slope to estimate uh, the normal strength here. So what you can see is on the packed sand surface, the measure the normal strength is significantly higher than uh, the loose sand. Although there's a lot of spa uh, spatial variation, you can still see a large change in the uh, ground strength, which is going to show the proof of concept that we can start to deploy this technology and for the robot to start to detect the force. There are still a lot of challenges to be addressed here, including the body pitch, roll, and yaw, the leg inertia that caused uh, the, the uh, errors in the estimation. Uh, so we're working on some of these efforts to improve the sensing accuracy. So how can we use, uh, assuming that we can uh, improve the sensing accuracy, how can we use this information? Well, if we can detect uh, the stiffness of the sand, we know that we can then start to use that information to predict the robot speed, uh, just like we showed from the mud. So essentially, based on the terrain normal strength and the shear strength, we would be able to create a estimated locomotion traversal risk map, where each of the grid will represent uh, the expected uh, traversal risk or the inverse of the robot speed at each of the location. And Y space is currently just a toy um, uh, illustration show you the, the places the robot had not traversed at. What we are trying to do with this is to inform the collective terrain, extreme terrain traversal in a, a heterogeneous robot team. So the idea is that we're basically going to send a high mobility robot to run around and construct this uh, estimated locomotion um, uh, traversal risk map for different platforms, including uh, wheel rovers and also the um, other shape of other platforms. And the hybrid team will be able to use this construct map to uh, localize, to, to basically navigate and try to avoid the wet region, red region, which represents a high risk area. Uh, we're also trying to use this to form uh, trust structures between the robots. So if one robot is getting trapped in the high risk region, the other robot can move to a nearby region to collectively pull it out. The other application we are currently working on is how to use uh, the leg sensing capability for scientific uh, uh, explorations. So what we are working on is to use the high mobility direct drive robots as a scouting agent where it can basically rapidly running around and assess uh, the soil strength across the entire desert or the planetary surfaces and, and identify interesting regions that you might want to explore. Then can basically share the information with other robots, potentially the wheel rover or the sampling robot that carries different sensor capability. And these robots can then go to those interesting regions to perform more comprehensive but uh, slightly slower measurements of the environment properties. And this setting actually provides a great opportunity for us to also study how human scientists make decisions about where to send the robot and what me measurements to take based on the incoming information. So one thing that we are doing is to have the robot to learn from the human how to base on each incoming measurement to make the, to adjust their sampling plan and how to connect the high level objective to the actual um, low level um, command of where to go and what to do. So going forward, hopefully we can integrate uh, the locomotion sensing and also these decision making results to create the next generation high mobility and robots with environmental awareness uh, to help us explore different earth and planetary environments. So with that, uh, thank you very much and uh, happy to take any questions you may have.
thank you. Um, I was curious, so when you're using the quadrupeds, yeah. it, it looks like you're using maybe some default shapes out of the box, but then using the onboard sensor for measurement? Yeah, um, I guess I didn't show you that part. So we actually, div we have like, we tested three different uh, type of movement. So the one type that we started with is a custom gate, where we command the robot to stand on three legs, so basically forming a, almost like test stand, right? Just like the flat surface of the uh, uh, hexapetal robot, and lift one leg to basically either do, do the same sensing normal or the shear penetration test. So that's a gate that we started with. And that basically allows us to um, not having to deal with all the body pitch and the yaw, and also not have to deal with the dynamics of you know the leg inertia, so we can do it slow. So that's the first thing we started with, and then uh, that's where we can basically calibrate ourselves. And the difficulties we are currently addressing is what if you are on a deformable slope? How do you effectively determine where is the ground plan, and how do you know that you know how to basically perform the shear? Uh, either normal to the surface, horizontal to the surface, or if you are poking at angle, how do you interpret these uh, uh, signals? So that's a gate we start with. And then, of course, there's also uh, some of the default gate we're also uh, playing with, which is the slow, um, slow walk and a fast run. So these gates are basically, currently we're using them to inform what the challenges or what difference, right? So we can take the same test at the same spot using the, we call it the stand and the poke. And then we also uh, do the, the, the normal walking. So we want to see, uh, we do it both in the lab and also in the field so we can compare the signal and see uh, what the trade-off between the mobility and the sensing it has. And that's also going to take forward to make decisions. So for example, when a robot is actually using the leg as sensor but also as a locomotive limb, how fast should you walk? How dynamic should you walk? And then how do you want to make, because the best way to gather information may not be the best move for you to move forward. So, and when to move fast and slow. So those are the decision making part that we're currently understanding is, uh, you know, how do human make this decision? How should a robot make these decisions when every step becomes a new experiment? Yeah, so, uh, so in this one, it's a external camera, but we also mount a camera in front of the robot, so it's looking at the feet. So that's actually helping us a lot, because uh, one, we can, yes, use it to basically identify what the pose the robot is, what's the trajectory relative to the world frame we are doing. But uh, in the other end, we're also using this uh, setting to do run locomotion experiments. So every time when the robot fails, either it slips or uh, traps or um, yields, we can basically uh, use the camera footage to basically analyze these field uh, footage to help us understand the failure mechanism. Uh, what we learned from the taking the robot to the natural environment is there are a lot of the rich variations that it's very difficult to create in lab environment. So for example, I was quite surprised by the, uh, we took the robot to the glacier ice place, and this is in, at the Mount Hood in Oregon. Uh, so we run the robot on this ice patch, and depending on the time of the day, depending on the melting state of the ice, it really have a very rich uh, behavior where it could be behave for the fresh snow, it can behave very much like sand. You can apply the same strategy and be successful. But once the ice uh, snow start to uh, melt and consolidate, then it becomes almost like surface crust, right? So you basically, the snow can pack it into ice sheet that you can basically rupture and then uh, uh, you'll basically have that force drop and then fresh snow underneath. So that turns out to be extremely challenging for like locomotion because uh, the, our hypothesis currently, we're still working on this unpublished, but we're working on the hypothesis that depending on your intrusion angle and speed, you can basically excite very different responses from these co slightly cohesive material and how you penetrate really matters whether you are going to uh, be successfully move or, or uh, slip versus uh, sink. Yeah, thanks for the great question. Yes?
Yeah. Um, so uh, one thing that I want to first comment on the four sensors, right? For example, the contact sensors, the pressure sensor, tactile sensors. Uh, we considered that actually initially to use that instead. Uh, the challenge there is that why you want uh, a very precise sensor so it can basically detect these subtle uh, differences, right? Responses like rupture of the crust, like uh, compaction of the snow. Uh, but usually those very accurate sensors uh, cannot sustain a very large impact force. So unlike manipulation where, you know, the force is not going to above like 100 newtons easily, but in dynamic robot locomotion, when you have a robot bouncing and trotting on the surface, uh, you can easily have very large impact forces. So uh, it's, it's challenging to first, like, you know, the, the large uh, heavy duty sensors that has large measurements that can sustain those forces may not be accurate enough, where the accurate enough sensors may not be uh, robust enough to give you that sensing robustness and not breaking on the repeated large, like almost crashing right on the surface. Um, and also, in, in addition to that, the wiring complexity, especially, you know, in many of the cases we talk about different particles, we want to measure force, for example, at an angle, at different ways. So we want to basically set up so that the force can always be uh, decomposed, uh, get a 3D force when needed, because, you know, you, you want, we're, we're in the stage of trying to determine what protocol is the best for different type of information. Uh, but if you were to mount uh, these uh, uh, force sensors or the low cells or tactile sensor, you get limited information through one direction or, you know, at most two. But when you start to increase that capability, you also get a lot of complexity in wiring and also the integration into a very tight space. Uh, so that was the two kind of like the major consideration for us to consider whether to use the joint force versus the, uh, the additional external sensor. Uh, especially for the, um, this robot is ready to be okay, but for some of the spinning legs, the rotation legs, uh, you need like slippering <laughs> in order to basically get the wires through, so that was additional complexity. Um, and yes, IMU can also give us acceleration information, which can, you know, start to imply force. We actually have actually some of the similar challenges in here using joint force and using IMU, because how do you differentiate if that's something due to your leg movement or due to external force? Right, so that's one of the key challenges. And uh, honestly, I think that it could be a good idea of combining IMU information with the joint uh, sensor so they can actually further use this additional acceleration information to know um, uh, how, to, how to basically separate their some of the momentum-based observer to, to basically deal with the external uh, force kind of adjustment and the compensation. So that's one of the things we're actually currently actively looking into on how to fuse some of these information to potentially improve the sensing accuracy, especially in the dynamic locomotion um, scenario. So yeah, great, great question. The, hopefully that answers uh, what you're asking. Okay. Uh, yes. So uh, on your um, uh, model adaptation, yeah. you take different measurements from your environment. Mm -hmm. what do you Yeah, like that's a great question. Do you use that bulk or do you use boost of energy or do you do a combination of other stuff? You mean how, once I measure the terrain property, how do I know like uh, how well I'm going to be able to move? Yeah, okay. Uh, so here is a simple version of that. So uh, how do we know where we are going to, uh, where we are going to do well or not is uh, like this. So we said that when you apply a force larger than the yield force, you are going to slip, right? Or uh, the sand is going to give away. So here we are basically plotting, you can think of this as a sand yield force, it's going to support you. And let's say you imagine a horizontal line, that's basically your applied force, that's your body weight, right? Uh, so uh, whenever, so if you go from, you know, once you start to penetrate your leg, your leg into the surface, the deeper you go, the larger force you get. And based on your body weight, at some point that horizontal line is going to intersect with the sand yield stress that's when you get force balance. So that's a point where you can solidify the sand, so to speak, the sand will stop, stop yielding and support you, you can push against it. And the larger or the slope is, the sooner or at the shallower depths you are able to solidify sand. Um, and that basically gives you more range to move forward during one step. So, you can, so we actually, if we were to plot the robot speed against this penetration depth, normalized by the like this, Everything like animal data, robot data, all collapse on the same curve. 
So that's basically saying how deep you have to penetrate like into the sand exclusively determines how fast you are able to move on sand. In, you know, of course, in the dry uh, homogeneous sand. Um, so that's what we're going to give us the very first order approximation. So based on the terrain, we can have a very simple formula. Just directly tell you what's your estimated step length. And then you can use that to you know, estimate your traversal risk. So that's a simple answer. I have longer version if you have, uh, want to learn a bit more about it. So, yeah, great question. Thank you. I think we have, yeah, one question there. Is that friction? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so <laughs> there's a microscopic answer and a macroscopic answer. Uh, so in the microscopic, each sand grains interact with each other, right, through repulsive forces and also friction. So with larger internal friction, one of the things that you can imagine is you are able to basically generate a larger force when you basically uh, force the sand to move through. And also, uh, you can power the sand up to a larger angle, right? So if you have dry sand, you can power to 30 degree tops. If you have wet sand uh, or you know, larger friction, angularity, you can pack sand to a larger uh, slope. Uh, so, so that's basically microscopic, but that also reflects in the strength of the sand. Right? So basically, once you have larger in total friction, it reflects in the yield strength. As I said, if you were to push on it or to step on it, you'll basically get a larger, um, uh, larger slope when you penetrate down or basically a larger shear force when you were uh, dragging through. Uh, I don't think it directly translate to friction. So you know, like a, or you know, for rigid ground, it's not a one-to-one -one, um, uh, translation, but it definitely reflects uh, in the macroscopic um, representation. And by by mirroring or by characterizing um, the normal strength or the horizontal strength, we would be able to use it more effectively towards the force estimation because all you need is basically for locomotion, right? So how much force you can generate, and what force do you need to successfully move forward. So what we were mostly working on is how to predict how much force you can get, so that you, know, you can use it in any general scenario to say my robot need this much of force in this particular direction to achieve the desired dynamics. How should I do that? That's an excellent question. Um, that's exactly what we are working on. Uh, the general principle is the same, but the actual estimation is very platform specific, right? So depending on your foot size, depending on uh, your uh, foot shape, um, or even the principle is the same, the actual uh, quantitative traversal risk is very different, and also you know, depending on your morphology, how you move, right? So that's one thing that we, we actually have um, worked on, like a, uh, very different platforms to see, you know, you can still use the same normal and shear strength, and that's pretty much all you need, but then how do you basically formulate into computing, right, basically how the speed reflects on that. But still, essentially, again, the nice thing is that it all, in the end of the day, it can all collapse when you think about, you know, the yielding point of, for example, the sand. Um, again, simple story, but you can still think about that, and the, all the morphology is just like on top of that. Right, once you solidify the sand, how much of the amount you can move. And then based on your weight and also your foot size and the foot shape, uh, what does that mean in terms of this uh, computation of when you can achieve the force balance? So, so they're, they're generalizable, but of course the specific metrics would, would be quantitatively different. Yeah. Uh, yes, maybe we have one question. Thank you. I got actually two little quick questions. Um, mm -hmm. This is more of a The first one is um, I, I noticed that you have a little strip mm -hmm. um, from your battery to the bottom right here. Yeah. Right, so does that um, sort of communicate you know, the, bad, the battery type of the thing? Exactly. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
Yeah, um, great question. We actually did. <laughs> We brought the robots, uh, we brought also the force sensing lag to the wild environment in New Jersey. There is a, a place where we have uh, a little uh, kind of bay area where there's like a rich clay and a muddy area. Uh, so we did two things. Uh, the first thing is that we actually use uh, essentially like something similar to this robotic lag to measure how much the mud uh, property changes spatially. So there is a um, much larger spatial variation uh, than dry sand. Uh, but also, there's also a gradient, right? Because you know, all these force properties are governed by uh, something, you know, moisture, water content, clay content. And, um, and when you, usually there is like a strong gradient in the environment that basically these things like, not necessarily monotonically, but like, like continuously change or uh, monotonically change. So what we were able to do is say, yes, every step you do need this, that's why we do this, right? We need online uh, information to let you know uh, what you're experiencing and what you should do and hopefully react quickly, even within one step. But also what we're hoping to do is by characterizing the gradient in our environment, we also have some knowledge about say, okay, so you know, as a human, we know that there is a clear gradient here. So when we walk one, a few, a few steps forward, we have some initial prior knowledge or prediction about how you know, either increasing or uh, decreasing of the properties the mud will change. So one of the, our current projects is looking at the shore to near shore um, gradient and try to understand how much variation do we get? Can we run a robot across and effectively adapt its locomotion to be successful by integrating sensing and the locomotion um, understandings? 